What is up, guys? Welcome to the Totally It's the Shin Megami Tensei podcast uh, video from This is Totally My Channel. Uh, here we got Spencer here from that Oziac channel. I was going to make it sound, you sounded like you just hijacked my channel, even though this is on your channel. But you may also refer to me as Bizarro Michelle, because Michelle could not be here today. So I am the sad, drunk, sloppy substitute teacher alternative. Yes, Michelle, like many of us, is broke. So instead, I've got this one loser here. Um, but it'll work out because uh, unlike Michelle, he's actually played SMT5, which is the game we're talking about today. This is an amazing intro. I hope you guys are enjoying. I refuse to re-record yeah, this. Yeah, boy, we're, if, we're, if, if uh, 90 seconds could tell a story, the, the <laughs> 90 seconds are really, really setting us up for success. Here. Three hours later, we're going to knock this one out. Of the <laughs> if it's worth anything, Spencer, this is still probably better than most other intros I've done for these videos, but I <laughs> I take the, the jank in stride. Um, but yeah, no, SMT5 finally out. Um, both of us got it early. Some of us got it out, uh, on release day for our reviews. I was not one of those. Um, but being able to play it early and having almost two months now to, I guess, fawn over the game and kind of give our thoughts out. It's about time that we actually, you know, sat down, discussed everything about the game spoilers included since not people have had enough time to beat it by now yeah uh, actually have you decided when you're gonna put this up because as of recording there's actually not a single spoiler cast for this game online yet i think there's one no then they, that then one they have titled it then they have titled it very poorly because i could not find it no sorry the other one i was part of a spoiler free i guess i'll link that now that i've mentioned it um but yeah, this might be the first spoiler cast for the game, which will go up in a few days uh, from when if, recording if this. I be, if I beat you to it, then that'll just be proof that I'm just negging you, apparently. You just need to do <laughs> you need to do what I did with my review and just title it slightly differently. <laughs> we, we need to have one word of difference between our spoiler cast titles. That's true, because let's be honest, if you're subscribed to my channel and you don't know uh, Ozzy at this point, then it's kind of like... How? How did you miss? How did you miss the last nine months of this year? Yeah, but uh, if you're subscri subscribed to my channel and don't know Spencer, uh, for a proper introduction this time, yeah, he runs a very good podcast, mainly talking about uh, Megami Tensei, uh, Persona, Shin Megami Tensei, the like. And I'm on there half the time because what else am I doing with my life? That's true. Because at one point you were gonna do your own podcast i think we talked about it and then you were like that takes time let me just be on your show so i don't have to actually edit <laughs> exactly uh but yeah no he also voices uh atlas in my nocturne review that everybody watched did totally everyone watched it please watch it i appreciate my my one second cameo in the opening of your smt5 video i was like oh man i didn't know i was in this video <laughs> i was tempted to bring you in to say something but i was like nod nah, drag out <laughs> we gotta, yeah, we gotta, we gotta get this out. We we can't turn SMT five into Nocturne two or God forbid Persona one two. Exactly. Without stalling any longer, though, um, SMT five. What were your thoughts on that? It, it's been funny because yeah, you mentioned how we got it in October with review codes, and it's been funny. Like the longer I've digested on this, it's been the reception to it's been very interesting it was not what i kind of thought it was going to be for myself let alone what everyone else thought like so for me i liked it way 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 more than i originally thought i would but then what's kind of crazier about it is that not only did i really like it a lot it was also one of those situations of i liked it for reasons i didn't really expect and then listening to other people's kind of complaints or criticisms and faults to it it's one of those things where, like, maybe I'm finally now becoming you with Persona 5, where, like, people will list their complaints, and I'm going, yeah, but I still love it. Yeah. I so, it, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's been very interesting, even though, like, I think the initial reception, unsurprisingly, was, like, everyone loves it, everyone loves it, everyone loves it, has now been, like... There's been some blowback to things like story and pacing, but nothing that's made me kind of change my own way of thought, which I find interesting. Well, that's the thing, because, like, I, I've i experienced my own roller coaster emotions of, like, starting the game, I'm like, this plot's awesome, and then beating the game, I'm like, this plot is, like, kind of mediocre, and then replaying the game and being like, you know what, 
I enjoy the plot. It, it's got its issues. Like, it's the game's not flawless, but I enjoy the plot. And everything else in the game is top tier. Like, you see people who... <laughs> they, they've been coming out of the woodwork of like, okay, so can we agree SMT5 is the worst mainline game? And I'm like, I want to see the lens you're looking through. You're allowed to have that opinion. I just, I want to know what you're seeing. <laughs> Cause I, this think, is... I think it's really telling that we've seen a lot of opinions like that from t like the Twitter echo chamber. Yeah. But there's no long form discussion about it, which kind of makes a lot of it ring really hollow. Because like, if you genuinely thought this was a really terrible game, I think you could whip up a five to ten minute video explaining why you think it's bad without just being like, it's bad because I say it's bad. Well, because <laughs> earlier today I saw a, um, a Twitter poll that I think LaRue posted where it was like, it was four options. It was like, yeah, SMT5 without saying anything. How do you feel about the story? And it was like best SMT story, really good, better than Nocturne, uh, like mediocre or terrible. And most people said it was better than Nocturne and like really good. Um, yeah, that, I thought that was a really interesting one of like, because like you can always kind of tell when someone, uh, ex especially in, with an instance of that poll, you can always kind of tell what like what their opinion is before they even answer their own poll of like, well, like judging based off whatever you might think of this and whatnot. Cause like, I always find it funny how there are some people, um, cause LaRue is definitely an example of this, of like l watching and hearing what he had to say about the game, playing it, beating it. And then after it released, how the emotion just slowly like roller coastered down, I thought was very interesting in a way of like, I can't think of many games that once I've beaten it and said, I really liked it. The more I digested on it, I really didn't like. Actually, with the exception of probably Nocturne HD, but that's just because I was stupid and wanted to platinum that game. But, like, w with 5, what I think has been kind of interesting is, like, I think maybe it's one of those situations now where, like, it's really easy to say certain aspects of the story might have disappointed you. But then also at the same time is, for me... I think it's literally like you literally can't look at this game's story and be like, this is the worst this has ever been done. Especially because it takes so many cues from other games, including Nocturne. So, like, it's one of those things where it's like, if you think SMT5 is a terrible story, then you must think that apparent that, like, by by that like same kind of level like then I would assume you look at the quality of Nocturne's story like it's just a dumpster fire. Yeah, but the part of this game, like, I, because a lot of people parade Nocturne as, like, a masterpiece in its own right, which is fair to do. Like, I really like Nocturne. And I, I do feel like there's reasons why that story might work a, maybe a little better with how it, I guess, handles its characters with the story it's trying to tell. But for the most part, this story and that one aren't that different. And there are a lot of places where I would say this one definitely exceeds it so nocturne being your 10 and smt5 being your two kind of baffles me uh. i i i think another thing about it is it's a very much a thing of when you're praising nocturne i think there's always that little asterisk next to it that people might not always immediately associate with like it is a really great ps2 rpg like for the time it was released it did a lot especially by consideration of other atlas games and other things like that but then like it's not something that like unless you have those rose tinted nostalgic glasses it's not going to transition really well like as we saw with the hd release yeah like it nocturne ultimately for the time was trying to be a much more expansive almost like open world game which they wanted to put a lot more on the journey rather than the characters and kind of have the characters just be like an interesting little backdrop which works. This is just, like, I guess a more modern rendition of that. Like, this game in a lot of ways is, like, a modern rendition of what Nocturne was going for. I feel like they've had the time to where they could have made the story, I guess, feel more natural. Um, I, I, have a, I have a question about that, though. 
question about you in terms of the story, because this came up on my community podcast where we were talking about, like, general discussion. And one of the things that I've seen kind of pop up in a few places and someone had asked me was, did this game kind of feel unfinished to you? Like uh, an example with um, the director, well, the original director left in 2018, and people were thinking, like, oh, is this maybe like a Phantom Pain situation where, like, a large part of the story uh, was possibly cut out? Like, for me, I, I never felt that way at all. Obviously, like, you could have made a probably entire second game out of just going to the different, like, countries of Bethel and stuff, as opposed to just cramming them all at the end. But, like, I think it's always easy to say what if, as opposed to what actually happened. So I was wondering, for you, when you played it originally, did you feel like, oh, man, there's a big chunk of this missing? That's... I didn't feel like there was something missing. I just felt like something could have been added. A a lot of people... I I think they point to, like, the first teaser where you see, like, Nahabino and Tal like, wandering around in Dot, and they get attacked, and they're like, look, look, the story changed, she was supposed to be there, I'm like, that, I think that's just a trailerism. Well, and all, yeah, and also important to remember, that literally was almost three and a half years ago at this point. That was, like, I think, literally, that trailer came before they said that they had properly started development, if I'm well, not mistaken. Well, okay, so, I, I went over this a little bit to clear it up, because, yeah, there's not a, in, there's not an exact timeline for it, but... The game had entered pre-production in 2016. Mm-hmm. They weren't really... Hold on. <laughs> wow. Spencer does. I had that weird thing of, like, I felt like I just swallowed my, my uvula for a second. Oh, okay. gosh. So they had that thing in 2017 where they announced it with the demons and they showed Odin. That has nothing to do with the overall story of the game. That was pretty much just a, here's a bunch of models, we're throwing it into Unreal, pre-rendered, there you go. Yeah. Then later on, the trailer we saw later in 2017 showing off a little bit of Dot and a little bit of the Netherworld, as well as, like, Tal and the protagonist, that's, again, proof of concept. They had it in, like, the rough sketches of it, of, like, here, we know what kind of story we're going to tell, but there was, like... Nothing of that seems like beta or scrapped content. Yeah, it's literally just point, a concept trailer. Yeah, it's like there's there's no real point. Like it was still so ambiguous at that point in development that they probably didn't have everything. Because like so much of I think of like games are so different than books and movies and stuff. Of like a lot of things come together last minute, especially with games, even narrative. Like if you just look at something um, like all of the like cut content from any game, you're gonna be like, oh my god, why wasn't this included? Why wasn't this included? Or whatever. But the thing with 5 that I find is so interesting is, like, the director leaving in 2018, well, the original director leaving in 2018, that's still three years of development, and that is such a large amount of time. Like, that's not an instance of, like, they lost the Visionary team. And another thing that people have brought up is, like, oh, is this a concern? Is that the Etrian Odyssey team was working on it, and the Etrian Odyssey director uh, did the primary bulk of directing and stuff. Like, I view that more as that they had a team who was not used to working in Unreal. They also had another team who had just finished a bunch of 3DS games. Is it better to make two projects with two teams or to, like... Because basically, think about it like this. Would it be better to have just kept that SMT5 team small and released the game in another two or three years? Or bring in two teams, have them both learn this new engine, and make it a better product and have it come out quicker? Yeah, and ultimately, I think that was for the best because... This game did take, like, a bit to come out, but I definitely feel like it could have... We could have still been waiting, for sure. Uh, And I'm happy with what we've got. Like, the the director, I I don't know if they would be, I guess, mainly... Not to blame, but I guess attributed to how well the design of this game is, like, layout-wise. That's always so tough. I think, like, I, I, I feel like, especially with Atlas... There's not a lot of directors currently who kind of oversee things in a way that we're kind of used to. Mm -hmm. Um, Even with even with something like we've seen in more recent examples, like uh, you're not looking at like Tokyo Mirage Sessions and the director is the guy who's coming up with the characters, the concepts, the story, and the world. It's very much a team and collaborative effort. Whereas like looking at something like Catherine and Persona Five, those had like a very small group of people 
who worked on it from beginning to end. But even with that, like, Persona 5 had the same director through all of its years in development. And that game got rewritten and scrapped, like, multiple, multiple times. Like, the original, like, the entire original concept of Persona 5 is not even in the, like, final product we have today. So it, it's just one of those things of, again, kind of going back to, it's really easy to look at what we didn't get and go like, oh, there could have been more, because there always could have been more. Like for me, I, I always think about like the original version of Zootopia. Uh-huh. Zootopia was originally just supposed to be about Nick as like a, basically it was a way more apparent racial uh, p- parody and stuff. And they were like, okay, it's very dark. It expands on the lore of the world. It's a very, it's a lot more thought provoking and interesting. But then eventually someone was like, yeah, but is this going to make a better movie? And yeah, they so added Judy, and they got rid of a bunch of things for it, which then it's like, it sucks because yeah, it's always going to suck if you didn't get the thing you know could have existed. But I, I, like, I'm at least looking at the story of SMT Five to kind of bring it back. Of like, I don't feel as disappointed in it because like, yeah, like I said, you could have expanded on things so much more and so much longer. But for a 50 plus hour JRPG, like the story that's there just never really insulted me personally, and I always looked at it as just kind of like. I liked what was there because it made me think, and I still wanted more, as opposed to when I rolled credits, I wasn't like, what the hell was that? Yeah, like, ultimately, I guess people need to understand more that ideas change over development, and you have to take what's there as it's presented to you. Like, you you can always think on the old stuff and be like, what if, but I feel like if that's skewing your actual, I guess, rating of what is there, it's a little weird to me. Um, but yeah, what's there, like, at most, I can think of, like, I, I keep forgetting that we can actually talk about spoilers, but, like... I know, I, I've, I've held my tongue so many times in public now, it's like, oh yeah, I can say things. You, you know, I, I guess to get this one right out the gate, the one thing that did insult me, I feel like, is just the couple nothing characters we got. Miyazu, after doing all the quests, I'm like, at least there is at least something there. What what was Yuzuru? Mr. Yuzuru Atsuta? So, with, with Atsuta, I, I, I'm in a weird camp of... I would have liked to have just seen his character used differently. I actually don't mind what he was there and used for. I think the problem with it was this, though. We get introduced to him as if he's a much more pivotal role. But as soon as we meet the Prime Minister... Atsuda is just literally sidelined so we can learn and experience more about the um, chaos route through Koshimizu. But for me, I liked Koshimizu way more from like a storytelling standpoint than Atsuda, because Atsuda is just like, I'm a, I'm a goody two-shoes student guy and I'm protecting my sister. What they should have done for me personally was expand his role, because I think what's funny is I actually don't mind Miyazu's role Mm. being subjected to a optional side quest my two major faults with it are this number one the entire thing should have been voiced i think that yeah. is so weird that none of it is voiced because it it's a big moment of closure and story for kansu and um miyazu so it's one of those things of like if you don't do that quest it's like where did the god from bethel egypt bethel go and then where did like a schoolgirl go besides fairy village town yeah and then the second one is this if she has this big sickness, it was never foreshadowed outside of maybe saying I have to protect my little sister. But even with that said, Atsuda never interacts with her in that quest. And this is involving her dying. Like, it, it's it's pretty much alluded to that she's going to die shortly after that side quest ends because she accepts her fate. So it's one of those things, of, and her brother has no, no thoughts about this, whose entire personality is just, I protect my little sister. I mean, yeah, because, like, I don't even... I think they literally only interact in the first 30 minutes of the game, if at all. They, they interact in the beginning and in the fairy village when they're looking for her. You're like, right. Until they, until, they, until they get to the fairy village, she, he mentions her a lot, but then once they're there, there's never really a clear reunion scene. It's like, oh, I talked to my sister, I'm next to her, and then, yeah, correct. After the fairy village, they n- never talk about each other ever again. Well, because my thing about it is... I, I feel like one detriment to Yuzuru specifically is, you know, we have our three main alignments. We have uh, Shohei, I think it's Shohei, with, uh, yeah, Shohei Yakumo, neutral, uh, him with Nua. Very clear goals. He's not really a 
deep character per se, but like we get his idea. Then we have Dazai, who I would say for whatever reason, Ansina actually is the only one for me that I think they really dropped the ball on because I think with every other character, I can kind of explain away their lack of a story because it's just really uneven for a lot of characters. Because like even for me, like I don't know how you felt, but like Yakumo. Yeah, he, he's not really gotten a lot with it, but, like, as long as you do all, like, if you, as long as you talk to everyone in the world, like, you understand his backstory on top of that, like, kind of exposition dump Nua gives you in the end of the game. Yeah, well, that's the thing, because even that final section gives Yakumo more to him that I think makes his character feel more well-rounded, and it actually makes him memorable, because he's the, he's the only one of that group that when he dies at the end you actually maybe feel something or like it's portrayed in a way that has weight um which is unfortunate for dazai because i was going to say with dazai another thing with him is you also get the idea with him it's just a slow burn you see him morphed into his ideal and it's really good i freaking love dazai but the thing with yuzuru is that he the other two are like extremists which is what makes a story with, like, heavy ideologies, more likely than not, like, that'll make it work really well. While Yuzuru is a very passive character, Koshimizu is, like, more assertive in, in his ideals, but, like, is, I guess, charismatic in a way enough to where it feels like that is the neutral path, like, it's less of an extreme idea. While Yuzuru is just like, yeah, I'll follow him, I want to protect Tokyo. You don't get a lot of his distinctive personality or what drives him specifically to do that beyond I care about Tokyo, I care about sister. He, yeah, he's like, just there. Like for for to to like be really just break it down super simple. Like he's like Atsuka is just a yes man, which doesn't make him a bad character, but with nothing to flesh it out, he's he's. Ironically, I was the most worried that was going to be what Tao was. Yeah. I was so worried that Tao was just going to be, I'm the school idol and everyone likes me. Even after finding out, uh, well, at least originally finding out she was the saint or like the saintist or whatever. And then being like, okay, I still don't care about her. <laughs> nothing to the story. I will say the smartest thing they did with Tao's character is killing her. That was uh, yeah. an out of left field move. It, it worked. Uh, cause that was like one of my favorite things in the game is just that perfect moment during the second area where there is a really good mix of, uh, and I kind of alluded to this in my review, a good mix of the lore and kind of building up the world and the universe and having all this crazy demonic stuff happening. Well, even though we don't know Sahori or Tao very well, there still is that emotional grounding and kind of character drive that is exciting to go through and i wish more of the game like if they were going to introduce that have more of the game be like that and if not stick to one side or the other which is part of why the story is a little disappointing because it doesn't really pick a side they have they have I three have options weird, and they I chose the true weird, ending <laughs> I, I have a weird what if with saori like i don't care about her character but i think like they use her she's probably the most stereotypically used character in the cast like she's she's literally just a means to an end for like chapter two but i really didn't like her kind of forced relationship with tao it felt very like unnatural like you didn't really feel like they were friends and i was thinking about this of like what's a way that you could simply kind of change that without actually like while still making the story have a better impact for everything I think if Tao was friends with the bullies Ooh. and maybe had been guilty of, like, letting it go on, that would have hit way harder about why she cares so much about her in particular, because then she will feel responsible for summoning Lamu. Then she will feel responsible for all these people dying in Tokyo, as opposed to just being like, she's my friend! And, like, well, you're d literally doing nothing. Like, you you have no relationship. They have no moment of being like, we've been friends. We've been friends since grade school. We grew up together. We, we went to the bakery. Like, you don't believe they're friends. And I think yeah. it would have been a tiny thing for it. of just like, I would have liked, and also would have given her character depth because again like until she dies she's literally just the i am the school idol stereotype and i have no personality let's because i one of the things i thought of just now actually is it maybe could have helped and i get i don't know if a lot of smt fans would be here for it as much because it would feel a little more persona-y and structure though then again Can people just replace <laughs> 
<laughs> on with Tao and make uh, and make her uh, the the God, why am I forgetting her the her same last name On's best friend. Oh, no, she ho friend. no. Yeah, we make we make she ho have to fuse with the Lamu. Not again. Oh gosh, but um, I mean, people seemed open to the whole like returning to Tokyo thing. Like that was really cool. And with that, I almost feel like. I don't know if it would have been better, but it would have been, I guess, mo like, better for that specific storyline if they gave us a proper return to Tokyo that doesn't immediately thrust it into apocalypse mode. Because you only, like, you can return at any point, but you only really return to Tokyo once, uh, where you're outside of the Bethel building. Uh, I mean, I guess you go to, like, the rooftop or something a couple times. You, you can, you go there at the end of every chapter, and there is actually, I always find it interesting, there are always different things to do. One of my favorite optional pieces of dialogue, actually, is after chapter two, um, you can actually go back to the shrine and talk to Goko, and a bunch of other uh, um, civilians are there oh, discussing I didn't know everything that. that happened. And then when you go back, it's it's funny how different it is of, like, after from chapter three to chapter four because of how much the degradation of God's will has kind of like mid making the city crumbling away. It's like nobody's there. There's way less civilians. The only people out in the roads are all like Bethel um, agents and stuff. So like it, it I, I liked how it returned there just enough that it, like if you kind of compared and talked to everybody, you you notice things change ever so slightly. Even like with just the aspect of like when you start the game, there's a random Jack Frost there, and I think he gives like two or three more updates as you pop back in. Uh, commenting about what's going on in the world and how much he wants to stay in Tokyo compared to the uh, netherworld. Yeah, because I did see that Jack Frost at least once, and I was like, that's a cute little inclusion. I didn't know that, like, there was more going on there as I would return. Uh, I should I, check that I, out sometime. I, I, will, I will say, the, the, one, one, of the, one of the things, though, really dumb, weird complaint, because I actually kind of liked how, the, again, they played with my expectations a lot of, we returned to Tokyo just to go back to the school for it to be immediately destroyed and turned into like a tiny little murder house dungeon. That but what I thought, what I thought was so funny though, is like then thinking about it of like, I cannot believe we never once see what the dormitory is like on the inside. All I wanted to see was his room. I'm like, what is this weirdo's room like? Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's why I say, I'm not sure if it would be better for it. I just think like if they wanted to go more for like a character driven story, which they do to an extent, I think giving us maybe, like, one dungeon separated before the school just gets trashed maybe would have helped with that and maybe given us more time to deal with Tao and Sahori and all that. Though, like you said, it is a very fun shock. Immediately getting back, it's like, oh, so we're going to be going back and forth. It's like, nope. Uh, you, you, I guess you will, but not to school. Nope, that's gone. <laughs> And also, I will say, dumb little complaint, I cannot believe you're never allowed to go back inside the train station. You don't, yeah. like, it's just, you never, you, you can never do it again. Like, I would have loved if there was just, like, um, oh, also, dumb plot hole that no one has brought up, but I can't believe how dumb this is. Mm -hmm. They never explain, after the tunnel collapses in the beginning, why it's then able for you to travel there, and it doesn't take you to the netherworld. Like, it's like, it only tumbled that one time. And then every other time, you can use it as a real tunnel, no problems. Don't think about it. Or, no, that was... Was that a different tunnel, I thought? Or... It's the same tunnel, the one above the station. There's the there's only one tunnel separating the dormitory island and the school. And it's like... Also, again, you, you don't need to do... Like, I, I, I love, like, again, if you break it down the really dumb stuff. Like, the map of Tokyo is very, very tiny. It's very much just kind of a nostalgic get-here-to-here point. But what I think is so funny about it is, like... The school's on the left, the tunnel is on top, the station's in the middle, and there's literally just, if you walk five more seconds, you could just do a U-turn to just not have to do either of them. <laughs> so like, I like I like to imagine there's like an alternative, like, like secret fifth ending in this game, of like, if he just walked home, didn't do the train station, just walked home by himself, none of this would have happened. Yeah. I don't know. I... <laughs> Listen, God's dead. Don't don't think about the specifics. God is dead. <laughs> Can I interest you in the God's not dead too, though? Oh, please no. <laughs> I I don't know there, there's a couple things like that in this game where it's like eh. And Tokyo has its mix of, I guess, positive things to it in the story, and then a couple things from like it's a little bit of a missed opportunity. But for the most part, I like that plot point. 
Th my point being, Yuzuru sucks. <laughs> After yeah, that they, they, 20 minute tangent. I, I, I will say this though, kind of bringing back the character thing, because sure you, you mentioned it for a little bit. I wish. I, it, it's weird. Like, I love how much development specifically Dazai gets. But I think one of the the things that's tough about it is no other character gets as much as he does. It's really which weird. Which is very weird. Yeah. Because well, a lot of people say... I've seen a lot of people say that Dazai is the worst character in the game. Blasphemy. Well, I understand the perspective. I just fundamentally disagree. Because I I can see if the, the Virgil hair slick back thing... If that annoys you and you feel like he suddenly gets flanderized, I can see how that's obnoxious. I personally didn't mind it. I thought it was fun. But, like, I think it's weird to, again, <laughs> I hate to crap on him so much. No, I don't. With Yuzuru being such a nothing character, Dazai has so much growth over that game. Like, that is, it's basically his game in terms of development. Uh, oh, yeah, like, they, they could make a spinoff that's just, like, Play 5 from Dazai's perspective, and it would be, like, its own fulfilling kind of game. Because, like, he gets so many little great moments to kind of, like, steal the show. Of Like, one of my favorite moments for him is after the second area, like, after you're in the second area, it's his first real mission. And he's just like, I am crapping my pants after the school. I just ran away. I don't know what to do. And no one makes fun of him. Everyone's like, yeah, he's just a fucking high school kid. Like, he's going to die. Like, of course he is. Like, no one makes fun. Like, it would have been so easy to just make fun of that moment and just be like, what a loser. Yeah, he just make like, some <laughs> demons. make it like an animeism. But, like, mm -hmm. I don't, like, cause it, it's weird to think about the only three characters that, like, actually get development in this game are Dazai, Abdiel, and, uh, friggin', who's the other one? Uh, Algami. Like, that's kind of it. The, see, the, the, uh, there's a things I would say of there's more, but then there's other ones. Like, Algami, I love. And then there's just a moment where it, like, I, I feel like the game forgets about him. Because I love, you mentioned this a little bit with, Chapter 2 is a really good focus of checking in with multiple characters about not only the situation, but how people feel. I loved that thing of, like, you would ask a question, uh, you know, you'd be asked a question through Algami. And then he would hear your answer, but still could let you know what he thought as well, because you are two separate people. And then I just really hated how after Chapter 3, the game just totally forgets all about him. Like, he, the fact that he has no opinions on, like, oh, I'm going to betray my brother, or I'm going to work with my brother, or, like, other, like, the only time where he has an opinion at the end is literally when he is erased from all time, which is, like, I feel like he would have had a opinion on all of these endings, so it was so weird that, he, like, he's a, such a great and developed character until they just, like, kind of forget about him. Yeah, I, I feel like especially kind of your note about, like, his thoughts on fighting his brother, there was a lot the ending could have done, that I think some endings accomplish better than others, but things could have felt a little more climactic. Like, you are literally doing a twin standoff in the neutral ending, at least. Uh, or I guess, uh, I haven't done Law yet. He's the final boss of Law, right? Other than, I guess, so, Lucifer. You fight Koshi Mizu. I guess as a spoiler cast, we can actually be real. I will say, I love that Algami was Susano. Yeah. And I loved that Koshimizu was Tsukiyomiya. That's like, those are like two of my favorite, like personal, like demons. That design, by the way, Tsukiyomiya's design is awesome. And also I did, I did stall out that fight. Cause you were like, yeah, no, they've got some cool moves in there. His friggin' like crazy, like 12 hit slash is the most insane thing ever. Yeah. It's, it, it's really funny of like the, the ending of the game is funny. It's the most simple ending I think probably any of these SMT games have had, at least in recent memory, because the, the and, the, and this is kind of going to get into its own spoiler thing for it, but like choice never matters in the game in terms of story. Your choices never, ever, ever matter until you're at the very top of the tower of eternity. And then when you just pick a side, yeah. But the thing about that ending that I didn't really mind was I liked how, I don't really view the final area as a dungeon. It's kind of like a 
hey, this is a recollection of what you've done, which I really appreciated of like, hey, did you do all the Demeter quests? Well, here, there's going to be a, a resolution of this here. Did you uh, side with Holy? Did you side with uh, like demons? Like, here's another quest that you're going to unlock here. How much of the compendium have you had? Well, Mother Nature is going to give you like an exclusive demon here with this. So, like, I liked it. It was kind of like, here's like a little final challenge slash check-in. Because like, one of the things I, I really am never a fan of, and, and this happened in Persona 5 that I always think was so dumb of just like, and now the part where you fight the four angels, because sure. Yeah. It's like, th that's not fun for me, but like kind of doing this thing of like, you're running through trying to get to the final boss. Everyone knows like, it, it's cause it's really just one giant race to the throne room. But the interesting thing is then, everyone kind of reacts to you differently depending on whose side you were on, what side they're on, and, like, the history you've done to get there. So, like, I kind of liked it. It's very short and sweet. The thing I will say, though, about... It definitely plays with your expectations in weird ways that I didn't expect. So, like, for me, my first ending, I, I ended up choosing Koshimizu because I was like, I am not going to beat this game and not find out what his Nabino looks like. <laughs> Unfortunately, the game cucks you, and whoever you yeah, pick just why? ends up dying immediately. Because, okay... I <laughs> I'll say this, I I feel like the game was kind of weirdly structured, where I feel like they structured the entire game around the secret fourth ending, and everything that goes into that, and then work their way backwards from there, where they're like, now that we have our perfect little ending, where, you know, we get a Nahobi in our transformation, it makes sense that Yakimo, who's just a normal dude, is gonna get absolutely obliterated when they transform. Uh... That makes sense. We're going to have, like, a three-phase Lucifer fight. All right, well, now this is our big special ending. How do we make the other ones lesser but still neat? All right, so we're going to make the other people get instantly killed, even though it doesn't make any sense because they're gods. Because uh, Nua survives so I, in hers, but... <sighs> well, she, she survives in, in one of the alternatives. I will say the thing I don't... I don't like referring to the expanded neutral ending, well, I guess I can say what it is now, um, of making a future where only humans exist and eradicating all demons. I like that ending as a really interesting kind of what if, but I didn't actually view that experience as like, that was the de facto ending. At yeah. Least. It definitely has the most content for sure. It's got the longest ending, it has the most fights. It seems like the one they were the most excited about. But, I mean, I at least liked the other endings. That, like, it played with my expectations. The only aspect I didn't really like of the other endings is, like, the fact that Koshimizu and Atsuda die because, literally, Abiel and uh, Azai held hands in Super Saiyan. Yeah. Like, that, that's how they died. It's, like, pretty lame. Well, but, like, then at the same time, it, it happens with other things. And, like... We don't really see Nahabinos being made a lot. We've seen it twice before then at that point, and it's like, I, I would have at least liked it if it was like, they start to fight them, and then they get instantly killed. But like, to for them just to die because of their transformation, I thought was like so Yeah, it's, it's really corny. I also like, I, I think it's weird that uh, for every time like the, the characters die in that sense, or when you whenever you beat them, the only ones who have no dialogue when you beat them are Dazai and Abdiel, which is the weirdest thing because they had the most development throughout that entire game and they say nothing. It's really in, in, strange. In my little dumb at lore explaining for that one, Abdiel and Dazai view you as a traitor at that point, and so they wouldn't really have, like, they don't really have a history of, like, he's so blindfully faithful to her that, like, he's basically her at that point. Like, that's why I don't view his transformation at the end as, like, kind of out of left field, because, like, he's slowly basically just kind of making Abdiel, like, his mom. Yeah. Through the story. And so, like, by the time you beat her in the, like, meeting room area and, and you bring her to you, and she, and she kind of, like, comes to, like, has a, like, coming to God moment, like, pun not intended, of, like, <laughs> being, like, I'm too weak. He showed, me, like, he showed me that, like, like, I, I can't do what I was put on this earth for. And, like, in his brain, you're kind of dead to him unless you start helping him. Which is why, like, it, it at least for me in my head, like, I, I get it. But, yeah, it would have been nice to have a little bit more of a thing for it. At least we get it with Koshimizu, which would have been super weird if when he dies, there's nothing. I will say I do really, really like the... When you do fight him, I do like the prevalence of just, like... 
him calling you brother. Yeah. But again, it's like, why could Algami not talk? Like, why could we not actually have these two talks? There's never actually a moment where they talk to each other. There's just like, I'm talking at you or I'm talking around you, but there's never like a one-on-one. I would have liked at the very end kind of like a Metal Gear Solid 4 moment of like Susano versus Sukiyomi, like just like beating each other to death. Um, you know... <laughs> It, it would have been funny. I'm not saying the game actually should have done this. Now I'm just thinking of, like, the stereotypical, the game ends with a fist fight. But all that came to my mind is, oh, what if we had Aogami directly fight Koshimizu? And then what are we left with? The friggin' human Nahobino punching Yuzuru in the face? <laughs> Even though they have, no, like, no build-up to that. It, it, I mean, I'm gonna be honest. Watching human protagonists do anything in 5 is always really funny. Because even, like... His, his walk and his run are hilariously slower. Like, he can't do anything. He can't jump. He can just kind of... I can miaze around the world. That, that's pretty much it. But, like, I literally can't do anything. He just does a little jog. Um, but, I don't know. Like, there, there's a lot of that ending that I feel like could have been handled better. The actual, like, ending ending parts themselves, I feel like we're fine. The, the first time I saw them, I was kind of bitter about how aspects of the ending turned out. So I was like, eh. On retro, like, on, on a replay, I think it's good. I like it. Thumbs up. Yeah, and again, it goes back to that, that whole thing with the story of, like, as like as long as you put it under a microscope, we can pick, whole, pick like, nitpick with it all day. But, like, for what was actually there, I liked how each of the endings made me think in different ways. I liked that the ending played with my expectations, kind of going back to, I pick... Koshimizu, I lose Koshimizu. So, like, it, it always kind of kept me on my toes in ways I wasn't expecting, which I would much rather have as opposed to, okay, I side with him, he joins my team, we defeat God, it's the end. Like, I, I, I liked that at the very least. Like, one, one of the things I think that's made the story always stand out so strong for me in this one was just that it, it always... It always did what I least expected. Yeah. Even if that even if that result wasn't maybe my first choice, I at least liked that there was no aspect of the story kind of felt like, okay, this leads to this. It was always like, wow, okay, this leads to that. Because, like, I don't know if anyone else who's going to look at the, like, look at Abdiel for the first time and go, hey, that's the law ending. And they're going to go, yeah, of course. And they're going to be like, also, she becomes literally a hell spawn and splits a demon out. Oh, of school. so good. Like, it... <laughs> I don't see how people don't like those two. Like, they... The way they shift, because, like, a, a lot of people, I feel, maybe would be confused at me saying Abdiel gets a lot of development, but it is literally almost a sort of inverse where Dazai fully... It, it, it's not the opposite of Dazai, per se, but, like, Dazai, you know, fully relying on God and kind of turning into that hardcore zealot. And then Abdiel, who already is that zealot, realizing as people start denying... I guess her faith more and more ultimately ultimately to acquire what she's trying to do she has to damn herself to cause those things to happen so you get that interesting mix of dazai who's fully in there he's like yeah you're gonna be my tool to do this and then abdiel is like yeah nope uh <laughs> let me split my head in half and then we're gonna win and then he kill her and they say nothing so okay, i, I want to give like one one p good piece of credit i really like to abdiel's character I liked how apprehensive she was till the very end about working with Dazai. Because I feel like it would have been very easy, but unrealistic for her once she loses to just turn heel. Yeah. I'm just like, ah, I can't believe I lost. I'm going to become Rita Repulsa now from Power Rangers. Like, I like that both of them kind of have to go on their own journey until they're at the tower together. Of just being like, okay, God is all. But we literally, like, to to bring back God, we literally have to defy God. And they both kind of had to come to that realization on their own, well, which I really, really liked. Actually, one of my favorite cutscenes in the whole game is that moment right before you pick at the very top of the tower. And it's uh, it's right after you defeat Me uh, Metatron. And it's kind of Tau takes you around and is showing you all three of your route options and what they're doing. Mm. It's kind of that little, like, flash forward sort of deal. No, I mean, I, I viewed it as, like, here's what they were doing while you were going through the tower. Like, they mm. were having their own little li little uh, thing with it. So yeah. So, I, I, en I enjoyed that, at least, of g giving you a little bit more, because I think it would have been really hollow if it was just, you get to the top, and they're like, I I'm siding with you, or I'm siding with you. 
like uh, to, to at least give a little bit more because you don't get a lot of the characters in the world even though I think this game definitely gives you the most character interaction out of any other SMT game um, that's another one that I always find funny of like if people don't like the characters or think like the characters are like weak in certain aspects I'm like this is the most a like regular SMT game has given characters in terms of like talking and doing stuff like in and in a, when i mean that i specifically mean cutscenes. like yeah it's very easy to have text only dialogue but like i'm comparing this to something with voiced cutscenes of like showing you these characters talking to you with these characters not just here is a thing in the world or here is a textless decision or here's a voiceless decision i made that's going to affect the ending 30 hours later well that's another thing because like specifically regarding the cutscene you're talking about like it People, I, I get why they have issues with that ending, but it does feel very climactic. Like, once you get there, it is just how going, hey, these two are going to have a war. You already know Shohei's coming with Nua. Just, this is where everything is coming to a head. Uh, <laughs> make your choice, nerd. Uh, but I, I really like it in that aspect. I don't know. I just, give, give me more, please. Otherwise, the game sucks. Um... One thing I want to mention, though, is for as many issues as the story might have, if, like, you hold it to that much of, like, a lens of... What the heck are the words I'm trying to say? Scrutiny. Yes! Uh, but one thing that the story does really well is it makes the actual gameplay and everything you're going through, it gives it a lot more of an interesting, I guess, tone or set piece. Like, most of the story beats are just made so that the actual experience you go through gameplay wise is as interesting as possible and it succeeds because like every area you go to are like most of the bosses you fight are pretty cool or like presented in a cool way so that was one thing i thought was handled really well yeah and it's like well, the, the interesting thing with the bosses as well is I, I i liked again kind of going back to the story playing with my expectations i liked again with the bosses of with the exception of maybe the 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 demon king for who that ended up being yeah i think i think every boss encounter i was like oh i didn't expect that or oh i was i i, I wasn't uh i didn't see that coming or i, I like like what they did with it and even and even in a situation like that i feel like that entire demon king segment is very much kind of like this is just like us just just kind of making here's a here's a very traditional kind of dungeon that you could see being played out in first person here you go it's it feels very old school kind of fantasy vibe yeah you're you're just you're literally storming the demon king's castle mm -hmm. which it's it's fun like i it's probably the least engaging part of both like plot and i guess like the lore in general but it's neat i think that dungeon itself is extremely fun so i don't mind the, uh, i don't know something about the entire third chapter I just really appreciate like it it did feel like a battle it, yeah like, it, it felt like a battle in a war which i really liked like even outside of the cutscene of like the aspects of like you're you had to sneak in through the tunnels to get there everyone's fighting in the air and you can still even see them with that there are these demons and angels you've never seen before cert making this giant flame wall having to get this spell so you have to go on this other journey just to get past the giant impregnable oh space gosh. wall uh, and then, like, the other thing with, um, just getting into the demons, like, layer with, like, that being its own little optional side, but, like, side quest of, like, hey, do you want to track down these towers and make this easier, or do you want to have this fight be really, really, really hard? So, like, I, I thought, like, that, that whole segment, I actually, I I'd be curious to kind of, like, do this with each of the four major worlds with you of, like, I think it's kind of interesting how different all four opening areas are throughout the entire entirety of the game yeah and just like they, they they always felt so interesting with all the weird surprises they had well because like the first area is very much like a wasteland like you don't know what's going on there's just random demons around there second area is a lot more like a like proper apocalypse world like you have all these human beings scattered around uh around like this very like properly like urban built city that's collapsed uh, and kind of going around there, there's, like, a whole sanctuary. So it's very, like, human-focused. Third area, literally just... Like, that has my favorite cutscene in the entire game of just when it opens. Like, all of the angels and demons clashing. A very, like, 
blatant law versus chaos situation. And then Area 4, where you have all of the Bethel organizations in an all-out race war. Uh, which is, like, that was one of the things I was thinking of when I was like, the plot makes the gameplay elevated. Like, even if I think they could have done more with those Bethel leaders, it still is really cool branching out from the center of the map, finding whichever Bethel leader you want, and then having some crazy fight with them. Especially Odin on top of his huge, like, stack of polygons. The oh my god, dude. Can we talk about, like, how cool those fucking cubes looked? They looked... Like... Oh my gosh. Like, that is... One of my favorite aesthetics in any dungeon of just... These giant... As stupid and simple as it is. Like, these giant floating pulsing cubes. With, like, pixelated staircases that float in. And then you get to look at, like, a snowy mountainscape in the background as you climb up. It should not work as well as it does. <laughs> Even when I first saw it, I was like... <laughs> in the back of my head, I was like, oh, they forgot to design this part. It's it, it, Aesthetically, it's really interesting, too, because that entire fourth area, it does a lot. And, like, I, I think the only thing that maybe rivals it or mimics it is probably area two yeah of like you're starting on a highway you're going into a downtown there's a literal fucking parking garage so shout out to the parking garage and then this giant then segment of forest that leads to a desert area with a river next to it and that's all like in the same area which is like so crazy but like i think what's so funny then about the fourth area is the second area is pretty linear with having a lot of like area diversity the fourth area literally just feels like, oh, this is our Breath of the Wild world. Like, imagine if every level was as big as the fourth world, it would be overwhelming. Yeah. Because, like, when I, when I got to the... Hey, I have no... Like, I know what to do, but I'm like, where should I go? Where Because it's very much like, you need to fight these three bosses. You can do it in any order you want. All of them are going to kick your ass right now, so you better do every side quest available. <laughs> Well, because one of my favorite things that this game did design-wise is each area gradually gets less linear. And it's introduced in a very natural pace. So the first area, it's basically a straight line with like one or two little caveats you can go down. Uh, the second area is similar, but there's like a whole other like side area you venture into. And then you got to go back and then like venture down a different path. The third area is like really like caverny and you have to find like really weird alternate paths to get around it and it's almost like a maze of sorts and then the fourth area they just put you smack dab in the center on top of a rooftop and they're like yeah you see everything here go there uh, uh I, it's so I gotta fun. be honest when i started the fourth area it, it's really weird because like kind of going back to spoilers of like you you then slowly find out that tau is actually a, re a real goddess like no she wasn't before but she's been resurrected kind of yeah and now she joins your party and when i started that i was like did i miss something because like I, I felt like the story went from like zero to a hundred so fast of like because you go to that, that meeting you fight abdiel all the parties basically branch off and they're doing their own thing and for me i was like okay story I don't know where you're going to go from here, but let's see what happens with Ghost Girl. Yeah. And that was like the last thing I thought was going to happen. I was like, oh, I'm going to transport you to this area that everyone's trying to find. Everyone's going to be there. You're going to have to kill everybody. And it's going to be just this. Like, seriously, for me, I think I might have spent like, like probably at least 10 hours trying to do everything in that area. That area is so big. 10 hours might even be an understatement for me. Um, But yeah, no, like. Because I, I guess going back to something we mentioned before where you mentioned people said that it felt like something was missing in the game. I don't I didn't feel like there was literally something missing that they like cut out. But I did feel like it maybe would have been more natural if there was a fifth or like a fourth quote unquote fourth area between the third and fourth and then push that one back one. So we get a little more with Bethel. Maybe give us a little more time with the characters to maybe have Dazai transition more naturally give Yuzuru something to do, um, may maybe give us a little more stuff with Tao. I don't think it's the worst thing ever with how it ended up. I think it's, I think it's still good, in fact, but it, it's a this little would, janky. This would have been, this would have been my suggestion if we had to go with the, let's say we don't have the budget for a new area, and all of this has to be done in Tokyo before the fourth area. 
Put it in the Demon have, King. <laughs> no, have that cutscene at the top of the uh, Tower of Eternity. Have that after everyone comes back and before you enter the fourth area. Have an extended moment in Tokyo where you get to reflect on what everyone's doing and where everyone's at headspace-wise right now. And then whoever you're with, there will be four choices. You can learn about Miyazu's sick time, hang out with Atsuda and get one-on-one -on -one time with the Prime Minister, follow or I guess stay with Dazai and uh, hang out with Abdiel, and, uh, or then the Tau option, which would then just be like return and just go like solo by yourself. And the, re and the reason I say that is then one of the big things with it was like the way you left everyone at the Bethel office with Koshimizu was like, we know where we have to go. We just don't know where it is. So we'll all come back after I find it. I would have liked if then you chose your ending then, even though that was still pretty early, would then be like, okay, your next job is to find out, or the game's job is to now show you how did Dazai get there? How did Koshimizu find out how to get there? Um, and Or if you're picking the Miyazu thing, the Miyazu thing would be like, learn that she's sick. And then you can find out about the fourth area because she's hanging out with uh, Kansu. So like, have a reason to explain why you're all there. Obviously, unless you're doing the Tao thing. Yeah. Because like only having Tao be the reason you get there seems really weird depending on your ending. Because remember, one of the things that's so interesting about Tao's character is as soon as she realizes you do not want the throne, she bails on you. Yeah, it's really strange. Uh, also, she definitely should have been the final boss of the neutral ending. I cannot believe there's no way to fight her. It's that was, very like, when, strange. When she, has, when she has her Omega form, that's why I, I, I... And I thought there was a secret way to get it. Because technically, if you think about this, the way you get the, the second neutral ending... So... Neutral ending is just, I'm destroying the throne, because that's what Yakima wanted to do. I'm destroying the throne, and I'm cutting the cycle off. Tao does not want you to do that. Yeah, she literally but, stops you, and that's when you make your choice. But if you do neutral ending, and you have not beaten Shiva, Tao will not stop you. So <sighs> there's actually a moment, though. You can still choose to destroy the throne after Tao stops you and signals the, the fourth ending. And I, and I went back and I actually did it just to see, like, oh, how cool would it be if almost kind of like a 4.5 ending of it's still the Destroy the Throne ending, but Tal comes back to try and stop you, and you still say no to her. That would have made the most sense to, like, make that an optional fight, and that, that definitely seemed like a wasted opportunity, because, like, why not fight her? You fight literally everybody else. Another weird thing that kind of comes with that is, like, the way she described it, she was like, what are you doing? Like, if you destroy this throne, nothing will ever be able to, like, change again. Like, we won't be able to fix the world. It's going to be stuck like this. And then when you say no, it's not even just that she doesn't fight you. She walks away and she's like, maybe next time. It's like, is there going to be a next time? Which, getting the, the secret ending, they do imply that something like that is still inevitable. But, like, she seems a lot more assertive about it up until you're just like, no. And she's like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I guess we'll opinion. deal with this later. I need your opinion. We've been doing a really bad job. I need your thoughts on Goku. Um, Goku's neat. He was chill. I I liked how they used him. Also, mm. I love they never showed him off in the trailers. I really like that. Yeah. He's a, he's a force throughout the entire playthrough. You see him in every area of the game. So it always feels like he's there, and he's always just kind of doing a backup support. And then as soon as his true role is revealed, of uh, he's there to help whoever is deciding to take up the throne. He's like it made sense. and a sort of like aspect of creation in a way, right? If I'm remembering right, or I, I more so like I, a guide. I view him as like um, I view him as kind of film on from a persona perspective of like he's watching. He can't really affect anything. And he also can't really help you decide what to do. He's just there to take whatever happens. He also he, gets he, mad if you destroy the throne. Why couldn't I have he, either fight him? He, well, he does get mad, but it is one of those things that, remember, like he says, it's not his job to tell you what to do. It's just his job to show you the way. And that's kind of the thing I really liked about him, of even though, like, even though he can't stop you and doesn't have any reason to stop you, I mean, outside of... It's ending the cycle. How does I, I at least I at least like the fact that the game 
the, the game did a good job of being like, I am just here, like, my job is this. It, it's kind of like, just being like, my job is to fill this role, and even if your job is to make that job not happen anymore, I still have to make it happen. Yeah, I, I thought his presence was interesting. It wasn't, like, the most interesting thing in the world, but I I appreciated him. Good VA. Um, I, I, I definitely thought one. it was Keith David. For the entire playthrough, I thought he was Keith David. Do we... Who voices him? We obviously know. I just... I don't know. He is... I know his first name is Reggie. I'm going to pull it up. I'm actually trying to... Uh, he is a very nice showman. He's actually planning on coming on the show soon. Ooh. Uh, Reggie Davis. Gotcha. He's done, a, he's done a bunch of, like, tiny things for it. But, yeah, Re Reggie Davis is... Uh, it's not David. It's Davis. <laughs> yeah, not Keith David. Reggie Davis. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Like, there, there are a couple characters. Like, he... I guess he left more of an impression on me than certain Bethel people. He's but it... better than Dazai. Sorry, no, no, Dazai. He's better than Odsuda. <laughs> he is he better than Odsuda. He gets more than nothing. If you said he was better than Dazai, we'd have to we'd have to throw hands oh, a little bit. Oh, you know what would be fun, but would be like its own video. Ooh. We need to do like a character tier list. Oh man, of like humans and demons who have speaking lines in the story. Where do we rank them from Dazai to Odsuda? <laughs> All right. Um, so, so number one is Ishtar, uh, <laughs> who I constantly forget is it was a boss fight in that game. Um, I don't know. Maybe eventually, if you guys want to see that, comment below. Uh, can, can I just say, by the way, talking about like Bethel things, mm -hmm. the meeting space where you, by the way, fight uh, Shiva and Abdiel. One of the most beautiful locations in the entire Oh, game. it's I that, gorgeous. That area is... So, I wish that was an explorable area, because it is so gorgeous in that skybox and, like, the lily pad kind of style. Like, I, I loved anything... I mean, I had to... In ex, in ex, yeah, any time I had an excuse to go there. And I, and I wanted to use this as a bit of a segue, because I wanted to know what you thought. I loved how they decided to use Sheva without actually using Sheva in the story. No, it was... It was interesting because, like, they kept doing the whole thing with Vosky where it's like, yeah, no, uh, Shiva's busy. Don't bother him. Like, I'm I'm, I'm just going to be sitting here for him. He doesn't want to deal I, with you guys. I, I was thinking that, like, Shiva was murdered and Vosky just lied about Yeah. Him. Like, I, I was thinking there was some sort of, like, betrayal going on and, like, maybe we'd see what was up with that in the fourth area. But it was interesting seeing, like... No, Vasuki is still following Shiva's will, but Shiva's just sitting back there. He's like, yeah, I know what's about to happen. And before any of you guys can deal with this bullcrap, I'm going to blow it all up. So I love the context when you when you do finally unlock the Shiva um, super boss fight. I love how there is a cutscene kind of explaining, hey, here's why I wasn't doing anything. I'm just waiting for you all to get the end and then I'm going to fuck you over. Yeah. <laughs> My problem with that, I wish there that it showed it in the ending. Like, that would have been that cool. Were, I wish that there was like an alternative ending of like you get the all gods ending because Shiva does show up in the all gods ending, and then it it's mentioned oh yeah and Shiva like fucks everything up and everything for you because you didn't defeat them. You know, I I'm wondering what if, what if they made it so in the game whenever you get any of the endings if you didn't beat Shiva, or if you did beat Shiva after like the screen goes black once you like walk into the new world. You actually did get, like, a cutscene of what the world looks like. But because you I, did it, that's why it I cuts always, to black. I always want that so bad. Especially with, like, how Nocturne, it, like, cock teases you with, like, it ends when showing the world building. Like, I always hate how it never actually shows it to you, really. Well, with the exception of, like, the normal ending, when it's just everything's the same. I will say, I would like to imagine in the all, in the oops, all gods ending, as I like to call it, in the uh, Koshimizu all gods world. I like to imagine that what would happen is Shiva's about to destroy everything. You're the kind of, like, ruling god, I guess, mm -hmm. but everyone still knows, like, who you are. And everyone comes up to you, they're like, Nahabito! Nahabito! Shiva's about to nuke the entire Earth! What do we do? And he just immediately turns into Peter Parker from Spider-Man 1 and goes, I missed the part, but that's my problem. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, listen, my job was to re the earth i wasn't i'm not here to stop indian people from taking over you know what you know what alternative uh suggestion well whenever we get a smt5 maniacs chronicles edition uh give me a secret fifth ending where i can side with shiva and it's just the new true demon 
where, where me and Shiva just destroy the world and then we vibe out in outer space. That's I, what I, I want. I gotta say, if you, if they did have the balls, flash the budget, assuming that this this game ever did get touched again, they could do some fun stuff if they added added some things to this story. Because like there, there's so many aspects of like, at least for me, again. The story that's there, I really appreciate. And, like, we're even not even getting into other little bits of story of, like, for me, I think the Demi Fiend little DLC quest is one of the best DLCs they've ever made. Oh, yeah. In terms of, like, it has pacing. It makes sense in the story. It's the only time you're going to hear Sophia talk more than five lines. You can go through so it throughout the actual game. Yeah, it's paced with your playthrough, which is interesting, mimicking... Um, the Nocturne experience with all of the fiends. And so it, it's very funny of like the way, and I mean, this can kind of transition into not story stuff impression, but like, I love so many of the side quests in this game way more than I have ever cared about any SMT side. I, I have never cared about SMT or persona side quest ever. They're usually the most like, seriously name me right now, a non story mementos mission. Like a mementos request that is good or memorable. Okay, listen here, buddy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like they're all they're all such fucking Phyllis Diller filler. Like they're so listen. I like boring. I like the one where you fight the guy who's abusing the cats. Don't do that. Wait, you like the guy abusing? the cats? I don't like the guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but no, because I I've been seeing a take a, a bit more recently where people are saying that these are some of the worst side quests in an SMT what? game. Yeah, I've, I've been seeing that a couple of times, and I couldn't disagree more. Like, this game could have been a lot more of random demon, hey, collect this amount of thing for me, and then come back. And in reality, I think the game only has, like, three, four missions like that. And the rest are, like, they have engaging, like, mini plots or, like, progressions that feel memorable. Like, I remember, like the Nekomata or whatever who wants a fish. I gotta go and beat up King Frost. I can choose to kill him or not. There's the one where they're like, yeah, we need you to collect the Mandrake. And every time you fight one, more and more of um, oh, Narcissus shows I, up. Like there's- I loved when they do when they do stuff like that. Like, turn a fetch quest into an like, increasingly harder challenge. I love that. That's the thing. Cause that one, especially I was like, uh, cause that one I didn't do until late game. Cause I had missed it. And I was like, oh, it's just like a fetch quest. You're like, you- uh, usually those are like kind of iffier and I go through it and the more the more they show up because they, they mentioned offhand they're like yeah other people are trying to find these mandrakes I'm like okay is that just like throwaway text which this game does not have a lot of like a lot of it is usually really good and it lives up to that when more and more of those show up really cool mission um but yeah like most of the missions in the game I remember really well more than some like story beats I remember half those missions more than I remember Ishtar. I love like any of the missions that are like, hey, kill this guy for me. And then you go to the guy and he's like, hey, kill that guy for me. And then you go, mm, who do I want to join my party more? Every one of those are always great. Well, actually, because on the note of Ishtar again, uh, I do remember in the third area, there's the, the side mission where uh, I forget the name of the the, I guess, angel. The, the one wearing the red armor that's not power, but he's got power with him. Uh, and he shows up and he's like, hey, you killed uh, Arioke? Ha, cool. Anyways, we're going to kill you now. You're blasphemy. And it's like, I don't know. There's I, just uh, stuff like that that's just like really good in world building. W would you like to know a weird secret that I don't think I've said anywhere yet? I'm, I'm making sure this is the same one. This is the one that after you do the quest... For that one um, Tangu, right? Where yeah. You have to summon it, go to the thing, and then you summon. Because I think the angel you're talking about is Gabriel, right? Mm hmm. Uh, no, no, no. It's not Gabriel. It's, um, he's wearing, like, red armor with, like, horn. Oh, I know. Yeah. It's, I always read it's, um, fucking Michael or something. Of, like, no, it, it's not one of those four. It, I, I know what mission you're talking about. This is, like, this is in the third area. Uh, okay, so it's not, it's not the one you unlock at the very, very, very end. No, no. I know what you're talking about, and that was also cool. Uh,. This one, I think the guy has, like, blonde hair or something. I don't know. I forget the name. It was a cool mission. There are so many just, like, angelic, like, demons, though, like, I always forget. Yeah. I'll do my demon tier list as well, eventually. I can't believe you forgot Uriel, Spencer. I can't believe you for forgot Michael or Gabriel. Is or... there... Not, not to call people out, even though that's exactly what I'm going to do. Is there anyone whose favorite 
SMT angel is Uriel. Is that a thing? Hmm. Comments? Let us know. I feel like every, as soon as we say that, we've birthed into the world someone who's like, I We're gonna... <laughs> the, the Uriel fandom is coming out of the woodwork. I want someone to tell me right now their favorite angel design is specifically Angel from SMT1. That's when I need someone to come out of the woodworks and be like, I love that one. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess speaking of Angel, the freaking designs in this game, we, we haven't really mentioned that much, but like, the new designs are pretty stellar across the board, especially like the Angel and Daemons. Like, I oh, freaking yeah. love those. And, and, they, and they do a good job of like mixing and matching when to show them. Like, I, I was, I wondered... Because I was worried after doing the demon ranking tiers of like, man, I feel like they blew their load in the beginning of showing this game and whether I never see any of the new ones anymore. Um, but no, I, I, I really liked... Oh, hold on. Because I think I remembered it finally. Are you talking about Raphael? Is that the N one you were talking nah, about? No, that, that's another one of the freaking trio. It, it's... <laughs> Do I need to look this up now? <laughs> No, it's okay. I have the list of them in front of me because I, I wanted to get this name correct because there was a fun little uh, a voice actor doubled doubled up work that I've not seen anyone piece together yet. Um, but so you know how uh, Ryan Cole Levy is uh, Kansu? He's also the voice of Michael. Ooh. And no one that. has put it together yet. <laughs> Man. But he's so late game, I can't talk about it. Oh my god, by the way, the amount of memes I've been sitting on, some there are so many spoiler memes I've just been sitting on being like, I, I don't know when or where I can post these, but one of these days I'm going to be able to post uh, my that really stupid and very overused, if you, if you didn't love me at my post-beginning of the game, Dazai, then you... Then you don't get me at my post end game slicked back hair, does I? <laughs> oh my gosh, uh, man! All, all I'm saying, people who don't appreciate that does I are, are not—they don't have fun. Ooh, talking about demons though, especially with new ones mm -hmm. and side quests. One of the things I really, really appreciate about this game—I haven't heard a lot of love for. I love that demons come back if you did their quest. Like how there will be sometimes be like, hey, you helped me get that A. Yeah. Sixty hours later, I'm gonna help you out now. I'm like, I love that. Even no, yeah, it does nothing of value. That's such a tiny little touch. I love. I I love how like living and breathing this world feels. Uh, it man, there's so much good to this game because like I don't, I I don't think this game is perfect. If that's not been established already, but like. It's pretty friggin' good. Like, I... I... I feel bad for the people who played this game and they're like, this is terrible, I wasted my money. I'm sitting here like... I... Initially, I got the game for free. I bought my own special edition, uh, I guess, preemptively. But, like... <laughs> listen, listen. Uh, but... I... Am completely happy with this game, for the most part. Like, I freaking adore the hardest question. Ooh. Give me, give me your sweet little question, I think, Spencer. I don't, any, I don't think anyone's asked you this yet. Okay. What is a better, and note my word I'm going to use here. What is a better RPG? Persona 5 or SMT5? For you. Uh. Because I, I... I... Little, little Timmy. He just turned 17. He's got he's got money. No, money doesn't even matter. You can buy him one RPG. He loves JRPGs, but you know he's never there's he, there's no other comparison. Not like he's played Fire Emblem. Not like he's played Dragon Quest. He, he just loves RPGs, and you can only get him Persona Five or SMT Five. What okay. do you get? Him? Is it vanilla Persona Five or Royal? That doesn't change my answer, but I'm just getting some context in there. <laughs> I mean, if you were mean, you'd get him vanilla, but no, you're gonna get him <laughs> royal. Okay, because ultimately, royal is a game that, or just P5 in general, that you can recommend those games to people who aren't really big into RPGs, and like mainly you're gonna be there for the story and characters and kind of that progression. I still think that the RPG gameplay in those games is extremely fun, but if you're just an RPG fan, straightforward. Maybe you care a bit about plot, but, like, you're mainly there for the gameplay. 100% SMT5. 
This is I, this is the best playing as Mega Ten game. <laughs> that's why I want to ask you because it's, it's like yeah, like you can obviously talk about like different. I, I think that there are aspects in Persona that like almost bloat it down. That like you need to know that someone likes elements like social stuff or like day management, time management stuff. Whereas like if you just want a good ass RPG, this is a good ass RPG. You a fan of Dragon Quest? Yeah, pick it up. <laughs> Imagine going from DQ11 to SMT5. What a fucking jump. Oh, and man. Then you, and then you finish both of those up with a brilliant diamond, and you're like, what are what is life? Oh, boy. Listen, listen. All those games are basically the same if you really think about it. Uh, I... I don't know. S- Ozzie, SMT5. Ozzie, I, just, I just appreciate that you're on the right side of history. That's what I'm <laughs> Listen, I can change that in a, in a flip of a switch. Don't test me. No, but yeah, like <laughs> genuinely, like people, people who are like talking. I, I need to stop bringing up the SMT five detractors that are already forming. But like gen, genuinely, this is just like the best playing Mega Ten game in my ex, like experience at least. Unless you're world's most hardcore Jack Bros fan. Well, yeah, and I mean, I think it's not even like that. It's, like, the best just because it's, like, the newest. I think it's very accessible. It's very well-paced, even with its story complaints. Like, the story goes at a very good clip. There's a really good mixture of gameplay to story. It's very jump-in friendly. There's no baggage or no series knowledge needed. It does a good job of actually explaining you the systems without feeling too overly simplified or without feeling like they cut anything out so in terms of just a base core game i think it, it has so many strengths that it gets to kind of um kind of pass off some of its faults for of like for me why, why i thought it, it's easily my rpg of the year was just one of those interesting things of just like it does so like it, it's doing the bread and butter basic stuff so good that everything else is just like frosting and even if i would have liked a little more or a little less frosting in some areas the overall cake is still so good to me and way above and exceeds all my expectations exactly like i don't know even just like the like if you want to count all the areas as like dungeons like this probably has my favorite dungeon like exploration or like structure of any game i've played it's got probably the best turn-based game uh gameplay of anything i've played uh and just in general playing through even fusing collecting demons and stuff is like some of the best the series has ever done so like if you like classic like mega 10 experiences but like are also into this new like more open world approach it's like perfection but maybe maybe Dazai brings it down for you. I don't know. So, I, I have a weird question. I want to kind of I don't I don't know how much more you want to like kind of put put in here. Or something that popped up with me that I thought would be a good kind of getting close to the ending point. Mm-hmm. If we had a moment to talk to Daddy and Mommy Atlas, what is one thing that you want Atlas to learn or take away from smt5 in a good way and a bad way like what's like one thing for you that like with future titles that smt5 should be kind of an example for positively and negatively smt5 for certain i feel like i i guess two big things to take away one the fusion system we have now is like perfect perfect just th- please please don't take away anything you've given me here i i won't be able to handle it um and then like yeah exploring more with like more dynamic open worlds like this and exploration maybe giving us like more things we can do in them um just the the way it's designed and fleshed out like the open world if i keep saying if you want to call it that it is in my heart that's like the biggest thing that they should really take from this of making more engaging worlds like this in future games when it's appropriate uh potentially if we get a new rido uh that that would be cool i literally i even with all of the like kind of love he got recently i still i do not believe with one percent of faith that rhino 3 is coming anytime soon oh i agree i agree i'm not saying it will happen i'm just saying you know 
They could. It should. Yes. It should be good. <laughs> um, yeah, and then things otherwise, like... I don't know. For negatives, if they could just stick more naturally to a certain storytelling style, whether it's a natural blend of character and, I guess, a lore, or going one way or the other, fine by me. This weird kind of ping pong they do, it's iffier. I understand why that turns a lot of people off. I still think they made it work by the end for the most part, but eh, be, be more natural within the future. Uh, what are what are your thoughts on that uh, regard then? <sighs> Replace all of the voice actors with just the main guy uh, from Big Mouth. Can we have the entire oh, gosh. voice cast be just nothing but Big Mouth references? That'd be, that'd be good. That I think I think you struck gold with this one, Spencer. <laughs> can can so, we just turn like, your your podcast into the Big Mouth? Uh, network. Oh my god, what, can you imagine what an April Fool's nightmare that would be? It's like, oh. welcome to episode 300 of the Big Mouth Pod, no, mouthing off with the Big Mouth. Oh, free. don't, don't come up with names like this, now you have to stick to the idea. Oh my god, um, so no, unfortunately not, not Big Mouth stuff, but, uh, positive takeaway, definitely learn from this pacing. This has to be the best pacing you have, at least in terms of opening and starting because i don't know of anyone even with like persona 5 where people like praise that game but like you're not playing persona 5 until maybe two hours in like that is not a quick opening yeah whereas like have that story beat have that intro meet your characters and then just wham get you right into it start playing something doing and having that feel kind of tra uh, transfer over I think would really help almost any of your other future RPGs. Because RPGs definitely have that stigma of people who even like them just being like, oh my god, like, it's so long and it's so dragged down, it does not need to be. No, yeah, this game, like, you literally get into the game, like, what, 15, 20 minutes in at most? Oh yeah, it's very, very quick. And it, it immediately thrusts you in in a very engaging way. Uh, now then, what are your uh, things that you feel they uh, should not keep from this? I would say... It, it, it's a weird one of not not keep from this, but learn that this game could have done better for. I and this is such a weird one that they've only done this with one game. Start voicing everything. I know it's expensive. <laughs> I was gonna I say that kind of jokingly, <laughs> but like literally, I can't tell you how much more it adds to the experience when just everything is voiced you have, like there's no point in this game where we're like god man can, can like do we have to hear this character talk again like it's nice because like all the dialogue is excellently written and it would just yeah. be nice to just constantly have that like imagine because like at least for me well, when i'm playing a yakuza game or if i'm playing judgment or judge eyes the moment that immediately turns it off is when i hear the yeah and they keep getting better at adding more and more of that stuff on there, and it's it's such a huge, it's such a huge thing of like how much more time and energy to get the, these voice actors in for. Because like you look at people like Koshi Mizu, and um, even Aogami and stuff, like these people were recording for maybe like a week. Like, yeah, they're, they're, they're not recording dozens and dozens and dozens of lines. So I, I would say try to learn from how much. Uh, we really liked with like the voice acting because for because like I guess we haven't really actually been over with this one, but like I know I have not been able to shut up about how much I like the English cast of this, even in characters like a like even with characters who aren't utilized a ton, like the little bit of Ashley I heard as Miyazu, I really like the yeah. little bits of Atsuda we heard, I really like like all the actors, all the casting, really really good job with that. It's just give them more to more. do. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, give them more because it's just going to overall flesh out that world ten times better for it. Yeah. Because, like, it, I just, it, it's weird because, like, again, it always comes down to money at the end of the day, but it adds to such an experience when everything is voiced. Like, because I know you didn't play this one. You played FF7 Remake, right? Um, not fully. Oh, my God. Okay, well, you, you've, you've touched it, though. Where, yes. Like, imagine if at one point it's just a text box. Uh. Like, what? Like, what? Oh. Like, the, everything in FF7 is completely voiced and adds to that, like, 
it, it again, it's a real world. It's a like it feels like people live there even when the game system is off. E even for and I think SM like a, a and lower. I think SMT five gets really close, but I think that like having everything voiced would like be that little cherry on top it just needs for me. Well, even for like a not low budget game, but a lower budget game, like Fire Emblem Three Houses did the same thing for literally everything, and. That one, even though I would not say it was, like, perfect with a lot of its dialogue, it still added a dimension to that game that felt a lot more memorable. So, Atlas, if you can manage it, would be preferred. Though, ultimately, I think the biggest takeaway to get from this game of how to improve... Atlas, please, never leave a text log out of your games again. <laughs> Why did you do this? You were, you were missing the text log? SMT5 didn't have a, a text log. I know, but I'm saying, like, so what did you miss about it not being there? The fact that if I were to accidentally skip over a piece of text, I, or, like, forgot what it had said, I can't go back and read. That's, okay. like, a pretty I'll, I'll, basic I'll, factor. I'll, fi I'll, fix that, I'll fix that by fixing an actual issue. Thank you, Papa Atlas. Don't turn off video recording for your game. That is also SM true. SMT5... The fact that you cannot take screenshots, I mean, you can only take screenshots and you cannot do video is literally haltering people selling the game for you. Because, like, there's so many moments, like, when you see clips on Twitter, it's like, man, this is a great looking game. It sure would be great if everyone else could do this at the press of a button. I sure wish I could get a screenshot of my boy Tsukiyami in his full form. Nope. <sighs> Gotta get that capture card. Yeah. I lost it out. I don't know, but... Is there anything else that comes to mind for you, or do you think we're good? In terms of spoiler stuff, I, I think we're good, but we do need to talk about, really quick, mm -hmm. we drop the ball big time. Oh? Could we just have, maybe, I don't want to be greedy here. However much times, time you want. A, a thousand times more Gustav, please. Yeah, you know, I I wasn't as big on the Gustav train as a lot of other people, but it is very nice seeing how many people came out of the game being like, man, Gustav is my favorite. I love this little gremlin. G give me <laughs> just endlessly. Give Actually, okay, one thing I do want to mention real quick before we close up. Uh, how did you feel about Amanazako? I actually, I, I liked... I liked her progress. That's a good point, because that's, that's another kind of story thing for it. I would have liked a little bit more, which is funny for how much we spend the game with her in the story, and it is not optional, um, at least up to a certain point. I will say, I liked her little secret. I liked the quest. I liked the inevitable finale of finding out her secret. The thing I want to say about this, though, is I really would have liked that they went into it or even had a, maybe a conversation with her and Algami, because they're the only proto fiends we ever see in the entire game. Yeah, and it's it's a little weird. I well, because I find it funny initially in the game. Like I I'm a fan of like mascotty characters most of the time. I like Morgana. I like Teddy, despite how annoying they can sometimes be. I don't know what it was about a Monozako at the start of the game that pissed the crap out of me. She was oh, so dude, annoying. My, my my wife hates her, like, still, because, like, oh, she only knows Amanazako as the, hey, 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 over here. You want some? Do ya? Do ya? No, but, like, she, she's just, like, a very loud, obnoxious tsundere, and eventually I got used to it, and I kind of, I did like, at least, where her story went for the most part, and, like, seeing how it played out. She was a little endearing, but, yeah, definitely at the start, I was, I was a bit less inclined to being an Amanazako fan. I also... I swore for the life of me that she was voiced by Erica Lindbeck. Uh, I forget who she actually voices. She voices Sahori. Oh no! <laughs> I I just looked up something because I was like, you mentioned the Sundari thing, and I forgot. I was like, you know what? I kind of would have liked if the game made a joke about the fact that this girl who's probably the size of your like penis. Don't no 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 no. <laughs> And I just realized, and I and I did a and I did the thing. I typed in rule thirty four, and I was like, "Oh, what's going to be the first thing that comes up?" It's literally the op the exact opposite of what I thought. It's literally Amanazako pegging Nahabino, and I'm like, "That is not what I thought was going to happen." When I the first thing I looked this up, you know what? Just like SMT 5 story, 
uh, always up for a surprise. <laughs> Never quite what you think it's gonna do. <laughs> the, the, se- the secret sixth ending of being pegged by a, by a, by a <laughs> You know, and I think that's a perfect place to cap this off. <laughs> Oh, man. Um, sure was sure was nice making that three cents of ad revenue up until that point. Exactly. Yeah, thank you for joining me, Spencer. Uh, if you'd like to subscribe to him, his content is really good. Uh, uploads very often, talks about whatever. Uh, subscribe to me if you want, too. I upload less frequently, but I'll try changing that. Uh, and any words for the class before we go? Three words. Sorry, three words. No, it's going to be way more than three words. Three things. Uh... Number one, thank you for having me on. Number mm-hmm. two, thank you everybody for listening. And if you did buy SMT5, thank you as well. And number three, uh, everybody go buy and play Guardians of the Galaxy because not enough people are buying and playing the game. So please buy Guardians of the Galaxy. That is true. All right. See you guys. Bye. Woo.